A great text for this morning is in today's epistle. Rekindle the gift of God that is within you through the laying on of my hands. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lois and Eunice, they are remembered. And that's pretty wonderful since mostly guys wrote it all down. And a lot of the New Testament is about some really good guys. With some amazing exceptions like the Blessed Virgin Mary and Mary Magdalene. But I love today's simple family reference. Lois and Eunice were the first evangelists to Timothy. I love the fact that we remember those obscure women's names because they were God's instrument. They were God's voice sounding into a young boy the hope that is in Christ Jesus. But then notice what comes really quickly. Rekindle the gift of the Spirit that Paul says he gave to Timothy through his laying on of hands. Our families can only give us so much. And what we're celebrating, particularly with this side of the church's confirmations and receptions, not only them, but of course this side, which is equally important, I might add, we are thanking God for what your families gave you. We're thanking God that your families got up on a Sunday morning, made you brush your teeth, made you get dressed, got you here, and you loved and you fell in love with the God of Jesus Christ. And somehow, through the mystery of family and through the mystery of other people you have met in your life, you know, like that bald rector of yours, and the way he loves Jesus and the way his palpable love of Jesus was somehow so compelling. Your family did part, Ben did part, Randolph does part, your Sunday school teachers do, do part. And you see, the great thing is, you will never be so arrogant as to say to somebody else, my faith. We never have faith except as it's been given to us. We didn't think it up ourselves. We receive it as a sublime gift from Lois and Eunice and our grandparents and our godparents and our Sunday school teachers and our youth group leaders and the people that taught us to use a hammer on the mission trip. And thank God, because here you are. Thank God, because here you are. Monday night, I was having dinner with this particular brilliant group of people, very bright, very engaged, very engaging, and a young woman asked me a question. <clears throat> it's a, it was a good question. It was a very obvious question, but it haunted me at the moment, and I did my best in the moment. The question was, what is the unique quality of what Episcopalians believe? Well, I thought... I've been an Episcopal bishop for 25 years. I should know the answer to that. <laughs> I really should. But on the moment, I really had to kind of think and, and distill real quickly. Distill real quickly. And I, I began to say to her, I think one of the first things that, that really characterizes our emphasis in Christianity as Episcopalians is that brilliant doctrine from the first chapter of Genesis, in the image of God he made them male and female he created them. We Christians and we Episcopalian Christians believe that to be a foundational text. We believe that every human being we encounter bears the very image of God. We believe that every human being is an icon of God. Every human face reveals some aspect of the face of God. For example, it happened in the Chick-fil-A in Warrington. 
I was standing there and there was a guy in front of me, an interesting looking guy. He looked a little different than the average Warringtonian. And I said, I can't decide whether I'm going to have the number three or the number four. He said, I'm going with the number three. I went with the number three. I chose my sauces well, both honey mustard and barbecue. And he said, you got anybody to have lunch with? And I said, no, I'd love to have lunch with you. We sat down. <clears throat> it turns out he's an Afghan. He helped our troops so much in Afghanistan that our country thought he was no longer safe there. So he's now living here with his wife and his son. He's got an engineering degree, civil engineering degree from a university in the Netherlands, and he's got a hydraulics degree from Virginia Tech. And we sat in the Chick-fil-A and he said, would you tell me what is most important about Christianity? And there he was, and there we were face to face. And as I looked into his face, I saw the image of God. I saw the very image of God. And then I went on to tell my questioner Monday night that as we believe that Jesus Christ put on human flesh in the incarnation, that he took on flesh. The word became flesh. Jesus, God's love, wrapped himself in human flesh, which gives human flesh a double dignity. We are made in God's image, and that human flesh has been redignified, if you will, in the incarnation of God taking on human flesh in Jesus Christ. Human flesh is an icon of God. And because every human being bears the image of God and because every human being has been redignified by the God who took on human flesh, so that has ethical implications for the way we are in the world. Episcopalians really believe that. We really take the incarnation seriously. Paul Tillich said the incarnation is the Episcopalian heresy. We believe it so much. But... You can tell we believe it. You can tell St. James Warrington believes in the incarnation and believes that in the face of every human being, there should be a bell ringing in our souls. Behold the image of God. Behold the image of God. That's what we say in our hearts when we meet any new human being. That's why those really awkward looking signs are out in the front yard. That's why we are working so diligently and learning so deeply from the people who are at First Baptist Church. We're doing that hard work because of our doctrine, because we believe God took on human flesh. All human flesh has a dignity. Lost dignity is our concern. We must realize that the God who has dignified us in Jesus Christ wants us, uses us, calls us, to dignify all that he has made. And so sometimes that causes us to stand at the food bank. Sometimes that causes us to be in the hospital holding the hand of a person who's so racked with illness that they don't appear to have a, their dignity. Sometimes that causes us to eat lunch with the person in the cafeteria that nobody else is eating lunch with because in our hearts there's a bell ringing. Behold the image of God. So that's one of the emphases that I think is so crucial to who we are as Episcopalian Christians. Uh, but I would also go on to say, having had a week to ponder the brilliant question, I think I'm doing better with it, having had a week to think about it, I would say that Episcopalians have, along with all Christians, a crucial view of Jesus Christ. And I choose that word very intentionally and very carefully. Crucial comes from the Latin word for cross. Everything that's crucial is ultimately etymologically related to the cross. So what is it that we crucially believe? I happen, if you, if you woke me up in the middle of the night and ask me, what do you think Christmas really means, I would say this, and this will shock you. I would say this, 
Christmas really means Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which is Aramaic for my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Christmas means that Emmanuel is God with us, that Jesus has come to bear our human experience with us, that God just didn't make the world and give it freedom and people misuse freedom and therefore God is removed from it. God entered this world as he made it and experienced the truth of this world as it is with nails and spit and a crown of thorns and lying naked on a cross in front of the whole world being humiliated and saying, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That means that God in Jesus Christ as the old Negro spiritual so profoundly proclaims, nobody knows the sorrows I feel. Nobody knows but Jesus. Christmas is not about the little baby in the straw. That's just the beginning. Emmanuel means God with us, so with us that he cries our pain, he knows our sorrows, he knows our issues, and he is not removed from it or distant from it, but participated in the midst of it. That's the God that we Episcopalians worship. His name is Jesus, and it's crucial. It's a crucial understanding of God that God suffers with us. That is unique and necessary. And it should also define our sense of this God that we adore. And yes, he cried from his cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And on the third day, he rose, he rose, God raised him, God raised him. And Isaiah, Isaiah, a prophet of the Hebrew Bible, had an intimation about resurrection. I, in one of my favorite verses in Isaiah, it says, Zion said, my God has forsaken me. My God has forgotten me. And then Isaiah, with I think an intimation of resurrection says, can a nursing child, can a nursing mother forget the child of her breast? Yet even if they would forget, I will not forget you. See, your name is sealed on the palms of my hands. That's the only metaphor in the, whole, in the Old Testament where God is seen as the lactating mother who if you forget, your body would remind you. It's total remembering. And on Easter Day, we see the power of God's capacity to remember Jesus from death into life, to remember him to a life beyond our capacity to imagine it. And we believe, we Christians believe, that that holy remembering God who is like a nursing mother, that that is our hope for this life and the life to come. So that's what Episcopalians believe along with Christians. And so being delivered from the fear of death, we are free. We are profoundly free. You're profoundly free. And because we're free, let's face it, because we're free, and God loves us enough, God loves us enough so that God has given us the capacity to choose God, which is God's delight, but we, but we also have the capacity to mess up. We really do mess up, and we mess up profoundly sometimes. We are the instrument of hurt and pain. We screw up, folks. We do. One of my favorite Anglicans of the 19th century is not a bishop or a theologian. He was a tortured human being and a humorist. His name was Oscar Wilde. And he famously said, I love this, I can resist anything but temptation. <laughs> and that is true for every human being in this church. In a few moments, I'm going to ask you folks, Will you persevere in resisting evil and whenever you fall into sin, repent and return to the Lord? I'm going to ask you that. I'm not asking you to be perfect. I'm asking you to remember the story of the prodigal son. Somebody asked me this morning my favorite verse in the Bible. It's this verse. I think it sums up the whole story. You remember the son really screwed up, was in a pig pen, bad place for a Jewish boy to end up, get kind of hungry remembers the servants have more bread than they need, decides to invent a confession, begins to walk back, and then the best part of the Bible. The whole summary is in this sentence. 
while he was still at a distance. The kid was still at a distance. His father saw him. And in the Greek, it says his guts hurt. Splegizomai, where we get the word spleen from. His father saw him, and his guts hurt. He had compassion. And the father, the village elder, ran like a fool in the village and embraced him and kissed him. And the Greek says he kissed him over and over and over again. This is lavish love. This is lavish forgiveness. This is consuming forgiveness. This is forgiveness that has consumed the Father. This is forgiveness that is so much more important than anything you and I have ever done. This is forgiveness that is larger than anything you and I have ever done. This is an alert forgiveness. This is an attentive forgiveness. This is a consuming forgiveness in which we are all so safe because we have all been unable to resist various temptations, and that's our truth, and it will be our truth. The question is, do we trust the way home? Do we trust attentive love that is vast beyond our imagining? Do we trust it? And if we do, and we do, because we're Episcopalians, and in right one we say of God whose property is always to have mercy. So we trust it. And when we trust it, we live it. Not only do we live it, we extend it. You may be the sign of God's hope to a person who is tortured and broken by some mistakes she may have made or bad choices that she mistakenly thinks define her. But what defines us all, what allows us to breathe every second of our existence is the attentive, merciful love that is waiting for us. Finally, I was preaching on the church recently at a big Episcopal church in Alexandria, St. Paul's. I told this story at breakfast. I was preaching at the church, and I was talking about reconciliation. I was talking about forgiveness. I was talking about how important the church is because all of us are living in a pretty unreconciled society right now. All you have to do to believe me is watch the news. And after I preached on the church being a sign of reconciliation in an unreconciled world, two men made a beeline for me at the reception. One was a United States senator, and the other was President Ronald Reagan's chief of staff. And they started talking to me, and they were appreciative of what I'd said, and they were very worried about our country. And Ronald Reagan's chief of staff told me a story I'd never heard. That One of his jobs was once a month he was to find a restaurant in Washington, D.C., where Tip O'Neill and Ronald Reagan could have a private dinner. Once a month they did that. They disagreed politically during, from, from 9 to 5, and they loved each other as two wonderful old Irishmen in the evening in the restaurant. And that was good for this country. One might even say that was essential for our country, and the senator told me that when he was first a United States senator and would go to lunch in the Senate dining room, there was a table in the middle of the Senate dining room that was the bipartisan table, and if you were working on a bill and you needed to talk to the person across the aisle, that's where the senators went to do that hard and essential work for our country. And the senator in this private conversation with me lamented the fact that that table no longer exists in the Senate dining room, and that is not good for our country. However, brothers and sisters in Jesus, there is a table. There is a table in this place. There is a table in this place in the host has an embrace that is this wide and that includes each and every one of us. And we're going to go there today. And then we're going to become what we receive. We're going to leave this church. We're going to go into the world. And we're going to be the hands of Jesus and the heart of Jesus, the mind of Jesus, the hope of Jesus in a world that's desperate for it. 
So when you, put, when you see your sisters and brothers this morning putting their hands on their baptismal font and claiming their baptism again for the sake of Christ's world, I want each and every one of you, this is not a spectator sport, St. James, or as Randolph always says, church. <laughs> Good morning, church. <laughs> it's not a spectator sport today. But as you see hands on this font, I want you in your own heart to claim your baptism. To claim the mercy you find at this table. And to redignify a world that is losing its dignity by the minute. God is desperate for your yes. Amen.